the only way we'll cope with the future is by realizing that we are a part of shaping it. And that is the quote of the day. Welcome back to the Quote of the Day show. I'm your host, Sean Croxton of SeanCroxton.com. Thanks for tuning in to our Thursday episode. Today, I'm calling it our Thoughtful Thursday episode because our featured speaker, Sir Ken Robinson, is a real deep thinker. He has some brilliant ideas, and he's the author of many books. And a couple of days ago, I want to say it was Tuesday, we heard from Earl Nightingale, and he talked about the imagination. He talked about creativity. But the thing is, is that Unfortunately, those are a couple of things that have almost been, I don't know, educated out of us. You know, just remember being a kid, you know, you have this crazy imagination. You would dream up all these wild things and you might be in class and you're, you're looking out the window and you're thinking of something really cool that you want to create. And what happens? You know, somebody says, a teacher says, pay attention. What are you doing? Stop that daydreaming. And over time, we just get taught not to imagine. We come up with a really awesome idea and we tell our friends and our family about it and they make fun of us. They say, oh, that's just a dream. You're just dreaming. And so we're taught not to imagine. And also when we're young, and this is going on with the kids today, is they're not encouraged to use their talents. You know, we all have these really just different talents. We all just kind of come into this world with different talents and then we have to develop them. But a lot of times these talents aren't developed because they don't get us an A or a B on our social studies test when we're in third grade. And I just think it's really important to listen to Sir Ken's message here and understand that there are some serious flaws in our educational system. And we're not teaching our young people to have creativity and to have imaginations and to own their talents and to develop those talents. And so I hope Sir Ken's talk sparks a lot of minds out there and encourages us to to make some changes. And so uh, here's Sir Ken Robinson. The difficulty is this, that human beings are not things. Motor cars have no interest in how they're made. And human beings do. Human beings are full of feelings and intuitions and values and relationships and ideas and aspirations and imagination. And you cannot educate people uh, if you don't engage with them as people. If we overlook the personal character of education, nothing else works. It can't work. It's implausible that it would work. You know, there isn't a kid in the country, I think, who, can get, who gets out of bed first thing in the morning thinking, what can I do to raise the state's reading standards? You know, <laughs> call me, you know, I'm at your disposal. My, my only wish is to serve. Kids are motivated by their own interests and their own passions. Now, I don't mean by this some limp conception of making everything relevant to them or of just following their interest. The point I'm making is that all children are unique and different. How many of you here have got two children? Now, I bet you, I don't have to place the bet, that they are completely different, aren't they? Even identical twins end up being different because they are all unique moments in history, as you are. And they're driven by unique interests and unique passions. And they are the people at the heart of the system who we are trying to educate. And we can't do it if we don't engage them personally, each and every one of them. There is no other way. What happens if we don't is we have a 30% attrition rate of people who decide it's just not for them. And interestingly, all the remedial programs that are designed to get them back in the system are based on personalising education to them. And if we would personalise it in the first place, they probably wouldn't have dropped out. Now, what it also points to is this, that the principle of linearity is itself wholly faulted when it comes to human life. Human life is not linear any more than it's impersonal. It's organic. And I'll just give you an, an example to lead us into this conversation. Um, have you heard of a guy called Bart Connor? Bart Connor, some of you may know. Bart Connor is in the book, The Element. And uh, Bart Connor, uh, when he was six, he lived in Morton Grove, Illinois. And he found that he could walk on his hands as easily as he could walk on his feet. Now, he can't remember how he found this out. <laughs> this is lost to history, but he did. He, and I've seen him do it. He does it in restaurants. It's all rather awkward, you know. But he, but he will walk up and down confidently and indefinitely on his hands. 
Well, he said it wasn't much use, you know, as a six-year-old, you know, but, you know, it got him attention, and so he kept doing it. And then he found he could walk up and down stairs on his hands. And again, he said it wasn't much use, you know, but whenever there was a party at home, and the, the conversation lulled, you know, <laughs> his father would say, Bart, just do the hands thing that way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and the conversation picked up again. Anyway, uh, nobody thought much of this except his mother. And his mother took him to the local gymnasium in Morton Grove, Illinois. And he said, I will never forget the moment when I walked into the gymnasium. He said it was intoxicating. I said, what, in what way? He said it was like Santa's Grotto and Disneyland all in one place. He said there were wall bars, there were ropes, there were trampolines, there were vaulting courses. He said it was intoxicating. Now, I pause to ask you this question. I mean, is that how you feel when you walk into a gymnasium? <laughs> now, now, you might. I'm not saying none of you does. You might, but I don't. I do not find it intoxicating, honestly. I need to get intoxicated. If I, <laughs> if, if I get within 50 yards of a gymnasium. Anyway, but Bart loved it, loved it. And he went every day because he loved it. And 10 years later, he walked onto the mat at the Montreal Olympics, representing the United States and the male gymnastics team. He went on to be the most decorated male gymnast in American history. Uh, he lives now in Norman, Oklahoma. He's married to Nadia Comaneci. You remember? First perfect 10. They have a wonderful little boy uh, called Dylan, after Bob Dylan. Why not Bob? <laughs> oh, we don't know. So, <laughs> so what comes to spending your life upside down, no doubt. But anyway, <laughs> but, uh, they, he and Nadia are members of the board of the Special Olympics movement, a movement which has so far involved 30 million people with special needs in high-level athletic activities. And between them, they've helped to liberate the physical capabilities of literally millions of people. Now, none of that would have happened if Bart's mother had not taken him to the gymnasium. See, she could have said to him when Bart was six, Bart, will you stop it with the hands thing? Like, you know, knock it off and do what you're meant to be doing. It's kind of embarrassing, you know? But she didn't. She encouraged him because she looked into his eyes and saw that this somehow characterised him, that this was answering to a need he had that was distinctive to him. And we all have those. Our children are giving us signals all the time about who they are, the things they're drawn to, the things that attract their attention, the things that attract their interest. You have been giving those signals out yourself your entire life, things that you are naturally drawn to, but you may have denied yourself access to it by now. I think, well, it's too late, or I won't, or uh, it won't work anymore, or, or, or you were turned away at the time from something, maybe. But the other thing is that even though she encouraged him, she could not have anticipated the outcome, could she? All she could do is start him on the journey. She could not have foreseen the life he was going to lead. I'm sure she didn't think, you know, Bart six, here we are in Morton Grove, Illinois. I gather there's this girl in Romania, you know. <laughs> you know, if we, if we move things around, you never know. Because life is not linear, it's organic. What happens when you invest in your own interests and talents is your life changes. Other people come into your life, you have different experiences, you engage with yourself differently, and your relationships with other people change their lives too, and they change the course of what you do. It's a synergistic process of being alive. And what we've bequeathed on our children is an inert system of linear planning which has its roots in the imperatives of manufacturing, not in the principles and ethics of the organic process of being alive in the world. Now, the old system is based on a meeting point of an economic imperative and a model of intelligence. We have a different set of economic circumstances now, a different set of cultural imperatives, and the only way we'll meet them is by investing properly in the things that make us distinctive for human, the powers of imagination and creativity, and finding those talents and abilities in ourselves that make us who we are. And this isn't some loose liberal idea. The only way we'll cope with the future is by recognising that we are a part of shaping it. And to make it work, we have to have all our wits about us. And to celebrate 
the real principle of ecology, which is diversity and the dynamism of different ways of thinking coming together and creating something fresh and new. Now, this is not a romantic idea. This can be done. In fact, it's the only way it ever works. I know great schools all across this country, and every one of them is based on customising the curriculum to those kids. It's based on encouraging the creative capabilities of the teachers in the system. It's based on the engagement with the community, and it's based on a recognition the curriculum itself has to be broad enough to encompass the broad range of abilities that the children bring with them naturally to school. It's not a way of avoiding the issue, it's the only way to engage with the issue. And I believe, by the way, we could make this transformation begin tomorrow. It, often, I think, people believe we have to wait for the government to do something. This government, any government. And that we look for a single model that we can apply across the whole system. That's not how nature works, it's not how ecology works. Uh, all the great schools I know are great, because they meet standards, but every one of them is different. And they're different because they're rooted in local circumstances. And I believe we can make the change the beginning tomorrow, providing the principles are right. And by the way, the principles are out there. Uh, they are running through all the conversations at Aspen. Uh, they're running through the way the culture is forming itself anyway. I think what a great organisation like this can do, a great meeting point of people like this is, can do, is promulgate a different type of conversation. And if we can do that, I believe that we'll find there'll be a new harvest of human achievement that we would find it hard to anticipate, but on which we will depend. Thank you. All right, pals, that was Sir Ken Robinson. His website is sirkenrobinson.com, of course. Today's clip comes from his audio program. It's called The Element. You can find it on audible.com. And that's it for me. Tune in tomorrow. It is Finance Friday. We're talking about money mindset with Bob Proctor. I will see you then. Peace. <laughs>